Run, run, run as fast as you can. Oh, God. <laughs> Can't catch me. I'm the ginger dead man. Oh, fuck. <laughs> That's not how I was expecting to start the show. You hijacked my cold open. <laughs> but, but okay. Hello and welcome to the pod, people. Tis the season for the sleazin'. Ho, ho, ho. I'm the ginger pod man, Matisse Van Rossum. I'm the Killsbury Doughboy, Ben Sheets. And I'm the ginger abuse man, <laughs> Cleveland Mosher. <laughs> Oh, uh, it, it's the holiday season again, and uh, we're we're hopping on that sweet choo choo train of seasons greetings. Doo -doo. I didn't think that one through. Yule at all. tide fear. Yule tide fear. That's what we did last year. I forgot about that. Um, cr Christmas evil. Christmas evil. That's a good one too. We're here to talk about the ginger dead man, and also, as a surprise to us as well, the ginger dead man too. Wait, guys, I got one more. What if it was, instead of Hanukkah, it was Hauntica? Oh, damn. Nice. <laughs> That's a good one. A pun so good it could have come out of your mouth, Cleve. Oh, thank you. Of course. Uh, yeah, we watched the ginger dead man, and... Last minute edition, Ginger Dead Man, The Passion of the Crust. And or. And or the the <laughs> bloody bakery. Bakery of blood. Whatever. We'll get we'll get uh, into that. Something. We were just expecting to talk about the first Ginger Dead Man and just doing a little little short baby episode, but then we decided well, 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 actually, no. They we, put they put a trailer for the second yeah. one at, during the credits of the first one. Yeah, we were just so so hooked. You know? <laughs> yeah, we just, we just couldn't stop. We were really captured by the mythos of mm -hmm. the ginger dead man. Yeah, the world building is just so rich and airtight. You know, for a, a movie called The Ginger Dead Man about the ginger dead man, this movie was not really Christmas related at Ni all. <laughs> Neither of these Zero. movies were. No, there was. It didn't take place during Christmas time at all. The villain was just uh, a a killer gingerbread man with the voice of Gary. Busey. I guess everyone in Waco, Texas, are just psychos that eat gingerbread cookies all throughout yeah, the all year. year round. Yeah. Whoever wrote this movie had something out for Waco, Texas. Well, on that subject... <laughs> <laughs> this is a propaganda film against going there. Well, we should talk about the, uh, the yeah. southern stereotypes in this movie, okay. because what in tarnation <laughs> were those? Hey, don't be coming after my people now. <laughs> this movie was made by people who think they had an approximation of what people from the south are like but have never actually been to the south they were like half a step away from putting incest in this movie like the the i mean one of the characters is just the charlie day texas oil bearing stereotype <laughs> Like it's it's just that it's just Charlie's character from Always Sunny. He's just he's just got the the cowboy hat yep. and the blazer and the bolo tie and the fake ass southern accent. Hey, wait, you sure do look as pretty as a peach. I tell you what. There were a lot of those southernisms, but none of them made as much sense as that one. <laughs> well, my favorite part about all of the southern accents in this movie are were that they were all mumbled southern accents. All the dialogue. Was so it is. Yeah semi incoherent at times especially when people got frightened and and totally incoherent at other times <laughs> yes like completely just slurred nonsense for one or two uh, lines. and i loved it and honestly just kept rolling the camera <laughs> well, and there it were, made it into the final there were a few times where like people like kind of whiffed their lines mostly like the <laughs> yeah. main actress oh my god and they would god. just kind of like stop mid sentence and just keep going like they were waiting to be cut uh, well or that they just sort of they kind of forgot their line halfway through and picked it up after that but it's like that's the take they decided to go with my favorite is in response to seeing some guy killed one of the characters was like holy shit, shit. <laughs> <laughs> holy shit <laughs> it's okay brick why don't you Take the night off early. <laughs> it's like that's the take you was. That was the best take. Well, Ben, why don't why don't you uh, give us a little backstory on uh, 
on the the company and the man responsible for these delightful films. Sure. Well, I do want to do a full full moon, a full full moon episode at some point. Um, this company, it's kind of notorious at this point. Charles Band, uh, who wrote and directed Ginger Dead Man, uh, he's produced three to four hundred movies. He started out in the 70s with uh, Empire Films, I think it was called, something like that. But he uh, produced some bigger movies, you know, like uh, Reanimator, Ghoulies, um, Trancers. The Puppet Master movies. From Beyond. He helped uh, jumpstart the career of people like Scott Spiegel, who wrote Evil Dead 2. Empire Films, his original company, disbanded or went bankrupt, you decide. You mean Charles Banded? Yes. <laughs> in the late 80s, early 90s, and in replacement, he made Full Moon Studios. Um, and Full Moon Studios, his kind of MO was he wanted to minimize human-on-human human violence. So you have a lot of movies where it's killer puppets or killer bongs or killer racist action figures. Or in this case, a killer gingerbread man. Yeah, exactly. So we get the ginger dead man, I should say. Soon to be a series, much like every other one of his movies, where they get four or five direct-to-video sequels. Well, doesn't doesn't the Evil Bong franchise go up to seven? Yeah, seven came out this year, I think. That's right. Evil Bong 777. Well, I, I know there's like four Ginger Dead Man movies and then a Ginger Dead Man versus Evil Bong crossover. Um, which I'm sure we'll have to talk about at some oh, point. Oh, absolutely. The thing is, like, Charles Ban makes a lot of bad movies. You can say he's kind of the, the West Coast uh, Lloyd Kaufman in a lot of ways. Full Moon has a lot of similarities to Troma, but unlike Troma, it doesn't have that kind of crossover recognition right. um, that, that Troma gets... Um, just because most of what it's done is garbage, hot garbage at that. But I will give it credit, you know, he helped launch Stuart Gordon's career, who did Reanimator and a yeah. bunch of other awesome movies. You forgot to mention, too, he's also a, a one-man band, Charles Band. Charles Band. Yes, Charles he band. did do the fantastic closing credit song to this movie shit slaps yeah i mean it's it's my it's my like song of the summer really like, it's it's my anthem it, honestly it was pretty amazing yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, the line scheme was so <laughs> bad oh my god it's so spot on oh, oh my god. god but yeah so he has made a lot of movies and the ego has very much gone to his head at this point he fancies point. himself roger corman yeah well to the point where a couple years ago he put out feature length quote unquote documentary where he just had roger corman sit down in front of a wall and record their conversations about making movies and they turned it into a documentary called Kings of Cult. Kings, plural. You you know it's good when you call yourself a king, so. Right, exactly. Um, but yeah, Ginger Dead Man breaks the rule of having human-on-human -human violence immediately um, with a fantastic scene from Gary Busey, but it just jumps into it. Doesn't it? Well, right. There's there's no there's no like preamble. It just shows a single establishing shot of a diner, and then cuts inside, and the first thing we see is Gary Busey shoot somebody in the head, and this is this is like 2005 too, so it's like post motorcycle accident. Gary Busey. He looks like he just woke up in a dumpster out back. <laughs> uh, I did notice in the credits that he had his own hair and makeup person, and he's only in this one scene, so he had this person working really hard for him. But then we we cut to uh, three people cowering under a table: a uh, teenage boy, a teenage girl, and the old man dad, who's like. We got to do something to stop this. We can't let him get away with it. And he gets up and he kind of like half-heartedly shuffles towards Gary Busey with There's like a lot a, of half-hearted shuffle with like a butter movie. knife or something. 
and Gary Busey just shoots him, mm-hmm. and we yeah we don't really see what's in his hands. This movie has a real problem right. with not showing what's in people's hands. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Um, I I can only assume that it was a, a weapon of some sort, but it was probably like a fork or some shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> they they really like their close-ups in this movie and their Dutch angles. Oh my but god! Close-ups that, like are, are any help to the scene. Every like, single <laughs> shot is a Dutch angle. Yeah. The cinematographer of this movie was somebody who failed out of film school and said, oh yeah, no, you're trying to make something look artsy? No, I got this. Just slap a wicked Dutch angle on it. Yeah. And like they're deep Dutch angles too. Yeah, and like, landing it's, shots. It's really it's like It's not like slightly tilted. It's like almost vertical <laughs> at times. Yeah, like, we, we were probably like uh, maybe a third of the way into this movie and I was like, we've, we've already got like enough of for like a Cinema Sins bonus content, like little tokens chipping off at the end of the screen every time there's a Dutch angle shot. Right. Like, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll say uh, for those who have listened to us for a while, our, our Thanksgiving episode last year, we talked about thanks killing. And in a lot of ways, uh, Ginger Dead Man gave me uh, thanks killing vibes. Uh, it was a little less trauma y, I guess, um, but still very reliant on uh, punny based one liners and goofy looking puppetry and just like incredibly bad cinematography yeah. and and nonsensical character motivations and <laughs> stuff like that. Well, in a way, this one felt almost less self aware than Things Killing yes, in a lot of yes. ways. Mm-hmm. It, it felt like sometimes they were in on the joke, but sometimes, sometimes they very they much were. were not. <laughs> uh, well, like there's so there's just so much that doesn't make sense in this movie. Like after the incredibly long opening credit sequence where they give the credits for just about everybody who worked on the movie. Are we going to talk about when Gary Busey auditions the the son? Oh, okay, yeah. Before, I guess before we move past the opening scene, we have to do that. <laughs> Where the son walks up to him and tries telling him to put the gun down, and Gary Busey's like, "You don't say it sa- again. Like, you don't sound sad enough. Please put the gun down. Well, now you sound like a pussy. Please put the gun down. Well, now you sound like you're bossing me around. Please put the gun down." And he just like goes on for like five minutes. It's just it reminds me of an audition. It's like, okay, now say the line. Now say it like angry. All right, now now say it sad. Now say it defeated. Now say it like you're a high school principal. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if like the the kid was just acting terribly, and Gary Busey started trying to give him an acting lesson. In and they just the filmed shot, it and kept and it in the kept movie. It in the film. <laughs> you know, I would legitimately not be surprised. Oh my god! <laughs> no, me either. That is that's actually incredibly that's, possible. That's, that's the most Gary Busey. What happened? Thing. Oh my god. Because Gary Busey is crazy enough at, at this stage of his life to start to just, like, do that. Yeah. And I bet, I bet like, the camera guy, like, looked at, at Charles Band and Charles Band was just like, keep, keep rolling. rolling. Just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then we get an extremely long uh, opening credit sequence and... Uh, cut to two years later and we see the the girl who survived and she's still working at her family's bakery but their bakery is getting ready to be pushed out of business by uh uh, by an oil baron restaurant by, by a restu- yeah by they never really explain what the the business across the street is like i assumed it was like another baked goods like manufacturer but then when uh mr texas oil baron shows up he he starts talking about himself as like a restaurateur and he's like my customers don't want to look out the window and see or um excuse me my customers don't want to look out the window and see your ratty old mom pa bakery sitting there across the street. So why don't we do this with no lawyers, no paperwork? I'll give you fifty thousand dollars right now, and you just shut the place down. To which we see him fumble in his pockets, right for a for for the fifty thousand dollars, and you hear the sound of like paper scrimpling around. But the shot holds on both of their faces. And there's never a cutaway to what's yeah. in his hand. No, you never of course see not. anything. 
thing. Yeah, like, because, I mean, they didn't have $50,000 to show on camera or any, like, large sum of money because money was... They didn't want to get a movie. briefcase they either. They could have written a fake check. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, any one of those people would have had a check done. Yeah, like, literally like, anything. Yeah, but, but, they could have done anything. I agree with you, and I think the answer to that is that they were just too busy to get to dinner. Like, some, like the, the camera guy just had to pick right. up his kids from, like, preschool in 15 minutes, and they had to get the shot over with. What I, what I also found interesting about this movie is that the whole film inexplicably takes place at nighttime. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. Like, for like no reason. At a bakery. At, at a bakery. Places that are known to work early mornings. Right, and to be open during the daytime. Um, but but we should we should talk about how the ginger dead man comes into being because we learn that uh, Gary Busey's character, the the notorious uh, Mimbleton Thromble Terry, uh, Thrombleton McWilliamson, uh, Member Mil- Snatch McCromble Stomp, Millis- Millicent Trumbull Scurvy. It, it was not a, a normal person's name. Uh, that he it was, was a gnome name. He was. It was. He yeah. was apprehended and uh, put to death by uh, electric chair. And they sent his mother his ashes, even though in the opening scene he's talking about his mother like she's dead. He's like, I think that was just. He's like, I can't. I, he's like looking up at the sky. He's like, I can't disappoint my dear old mama. And it's I like, think, well, I think that was Busey just not understanding what was yeah, really was supposed to going or, on, yeah. be going on. He, he um, might have like just in his in his few like state a state of reading the script saw the word mom and just like improvised. <laughs> that. Um, but. Uh, we see our, our protagonist, uh, what's her face, at the bakery, uh, out loud reminiscing about how Gary Busey uh, killed her her father and her brother. She and has like how, newspaper clippings on like, the wall, like hanging up on the wall in the bakery <laughs> of like Gary Busey's deranged face, <laughs> and uh, and talking about how today would have been her brother's twenty first birthday, and man, oh man, he really wanted to spend it at the titty bar, but because. <laughs> Because Gary Busey killed him, now he can't get those sweet titties in his face. I'm not kidding. This is like no, that was that totally what, what that, was this is what said. she's talking about. Um, and we also get like like an echoey Gary Busey voiceover of something that we never saw him saying to her. Yeah, assumedly in a court case scene. Right, I'm a, I'll get you from the grave because I'm because my I'm mama's a snatch. witch. I'm Mimble Snatch Terry Bottom. <laughs> Um, and then she gets a, a knock on the door of the, on the back door of the <laughs> oh, bakery God. and she opens it and, and finds just a large cardboard box labeled gingerbread seasoning, grandma's gingerbread seasoning, grandma's gingerbread seasoning. And she looks up down the alley and we see a person in, and this, this part, this part does take place in the daylight. We see a person in a full hooded black Death Eater cloak, just slowly <laughs> rounding the corner at the end of the alley. Yeah, trundling. <laughs> trundling, yeah. And she doesn't seem, our, our protagonist doesn't seem perturbed by this at all. Nope. And then uh, her her coworker or employee or whatever uh, named Brick, who- Wait, I just realized something. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But, yeah. But- w- did you say the barrels were labeled gingerbread seasoning? I, I did say that. Wouldn't that be ginger? <laughs> <laughs> did we not even? Because I missed that. <laughs> oh my god, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a beautiful detail right there. We all just blindly accepted the box of gingerbread seasoning. Not <laughs> just maybe cinnamon. That's all it is. I mean, I've never, I've never been in sugar. That's it. That's all ginger is. Bread is, I think. I don't bake, but then, I don't bake either. It, I just, oh, oh my god! Oh god! <laughs> but uh, then uh, uh, Brick, the the 
baker who thinks that uh wrestling is real um so that's how i know he's not a true fan i mean as a Um, scrawny dumb person that likes wrestling i uh i (laughs) i uh related to him hardcore well, he uh, he somehow like lacerates the fuck out of his arm, uh, and <coughs> and drips some of his blood into the gingerbread seasoning. Yeah, they try. To, indu- it's also like an industrial sized barrel. They try to seasoning. stop oh, yeah. the bleeding by holding his arm over this giant yeah. bat of. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they don't notice the blood gets in it. Yeah, I, I would say their their bakery is already like just through no fault of any evil monsters or whatever, doesn't deserve to be opened. If they're getting blood in their fucking, like, stuff. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. It's unacceptable, like, yeah. Well, they they put the dough in, uh, like, an industrial mixer, like a huge one, and it cuts to a close-up of the dough mixing in the blood, but it's clearly just, like, a bowl with somebody moving, like, a spoon around. (laughs) Like, it's definitely... (laughs) Can we talk about, like, the industrial equipment in the background whenever they go into the back of the small mom-and-pop You mean, like, the the bakery room? The the room-sized oven? It's it's like, yeah, they have a small (laughs) mom-and-pop-sized front, and that's seems to be the whole of the building but then when they go into the back it's they, like a warehouse yeah, yeah. It's, it's like their bakery is a tardis like from doctor yeah Who. It's, it's like bigger on the inside well yeah they have they have like a full walk-in mm-hmm. oven they have like the, all of these rows of like industrial mixers and they expect us to believe that like a family runs this by their mm-hmm. themselves and this is like a mom and pop bakery yeah that industrial mixer was the size of a truck like it was huge it was big it's yeah. a factory which yeah. is why it's really funny when they do the close-up of somebody just stirring red food coloring mm. into some dough with a wooden spoon my favorite part of that is right after you get a little hand oh, that like comes a little, out. Oh, like a little baby hand that, like, starts to come out of the dough. Okay, I- I'm going to skip some details, but what what we need to discuss is how convoluted this evil witch's plan was to to create this Gary Busey ginger dead man. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through the <laughs> steps of everything that happened to lead to the creation of this small sentient serial killer cookie. Um, so first, uh, they they put Gary Busey's ashes into some gingerbread seasoning, which then just so happened to get some blood in it which was then put into an industrial walk-in oven, which then the power shorted out, which then caused a surge in the oven, causing, like, Tesla coil explosions. (laughs) And all of this is what created the ginger dead man. How fucking convoluted is that? It makes child's play seem like a like a kid story, honestly. Right. Like, like if like how how did the witch give these these ashes and the gingerbread seasoning to these people just on the off chance that some idiot named Brick would cut himself over the seasoning and that then uh, a a power surge would happen in the oven granting life to the to the cookie yeah also they would just happen to be like conveniently out of gingerbread seasoning like at that time (laughs) right well i mean it wouldn't it would make sense to set this movie around like you know christmas time when like people would be eating gingerbread and oh there's a we, we have a gingerbread shortage oh shit Someone delivered this box of gingerbread seasoning to us. Thank God we were all out and just in time for Christmas, too. Wait, it's a Christmas miracle. See, like, that yeah. that that's what it would happen if you took even five seconds to to come up with, you know, a setting for, for this film. You know, Wait, that's asking way too the, much of this movie. <laughs> it's really lucky that they made a gingerbread men and not ginger snaps. Can you imagine just circular cookies rolling around <laughs> trying to kill people? Well, right. Also, that they would have to, that she would happen to. And like also another thing I was thinking about, she used that dough to make one one gingerbread man she had like the one stencil big old boy one big old boy 
But then she, what, did she just throw away the rest of the dough? Does that dough also contain the consciousness of Gary Busey? Is that just, is part of his consciousness just in the trash somewhere? Yeah, is it divvied up? Is he like a, like a lich? If she, you know, if he has she like had, different phylacteries of gingerbread men. If she had made more than one gingerbread man out of that dough, would they all have been Gary Busey? Would his soul just have been in one of them? These are questions that are not answered by the gingerbread man. and I need, Or the sequel. Or the yeah. sequel. And I need that deeper ginger dead man lore. Yeah, absolutely. I need to know. Yeah, where is the anthology? Where is like the the appendices? I mean, of there's the there's like man? there's like three more movies after what we watch. So who knows? Like, Maybe our answers, our uh, our questions are answered in there. That that's very likely. I let's pause this and go ahead and go watch the rest of them. All right, folks, we'll be back. We'll be back in about four hours. And we're back. And the the rest of the movies did not answer any of our Ginger Dead Man lore questions. But since we didn't actually see the movies, how can we say that? Uh, shut shit? up. We don't. Shut, shut up. up. Shut up. Shut up. We have a, do a service. For you're breaking people. the, Cleveland, you're breaking the fourth wall. This Cleveland, you're wrong. breaking the fourth wall. Wrong. I'm going to break your face, Cleveland. You're breaking the fourth wall and I'm going to break your face. Just shut the fuck up. So once once the ginger dead man uh, is is animate, he goes on uh, a, a brief killing spree. Um, there's the there's the drunk grandma who is the first to see him. Actually, you know what? No, um, uh, our main character and uh, Texas oil baron's daughter and her boyfriend who are there trying to sabotage the bakery by putting rats in it? Yeah, or a, a single rat. One rat. <laughs> um, that's right. They they first see the ginger dead man come out of... Pete the Rat. Uh, yeah, Pete the Rat. That's right. He was named in the credits. Yeah, because he had um, rented it from Petco. Yeah. That's right. Um, they, they see the ginger dead man. They, they let him out of the oven, and he runs off. And they immediately forget about him. Oh, but let's talk about the scale of the gingerbread man, too, like compared to the cookie that he was made of, that was originally made of him. Like the, the cookie was was like uh, was was quite large. I would say, what, like four feet, you know, in height. It was a, it was a very no, large. I don't know about big. that. Not that big. It was uh, it was a pretty feet? large. It was a pretty large stencil. Two feet. Okay, maybe. Cookie it was, was two feet. Well, I mean, regardless, it was two feet still. Regard, like it could have been a foot, and it still wouldn't have made any sense because dough expands when you right. cook it, and yet the the monster is is what five inches? He's pretty small. Yeah. He's a little guy. He's he's wielding like a paring knife as like a like a like a Zweihander. <laughs> yeah. So like he's he's a little he's a little guy, um, and is somehow able to wreak lots of havoc on that scale, despite the fact that. He doesn't really have any magical powers. No. He just kind of is a, a gingerbread man with the mind and soul of Gary Busey. Um, <laughs> uh, which, I guess someone, is, which I guess is monstrous in its own right. Man, if someone came to me pitching a movie with that, I would, I would green, light I green light it immediately. It immediately. <laughs> um, and they, they forget about him. They like go up to the front of the uh, of like the the store and they're like oh we need to call the police oh no he's cut the power let's try my dad on on my cell phone oh my cell phone died and then uh the boyfriend is just like hold on i'm gonna go get my gun out of the car and he's gone for like five minutes and the and the whole time like the the two girls who are supposed to be like enemies are like staying there talking like all casual all casual like i just keep him around cuz i think he'll make me more popular uh and they're just like joking back and forth and like sort of talking shit on the boyfriend and it's like they're supposed to hate each other they're supposed to be enemies <laughs> like when did they become friends and also like there was a ginger, a, a ginger dead man running around, mm -hmm. and they've just forgotten about him. They do that a lot. Anytime he's not in the shot, yeah, them, anytime, they just forget. Yeah, anytime he's not on camera, uh, the characters forget about the ginger yeah. dead man. Do you guys remember what the boyfriend's name was? A Amos, I think. Which I wonder if that was a joke, be if it was supposed to be like famous Amos cookies. 
Huh. I wouldn't surprise me. It would not I mean, it, that's also let, what let's to take a second to talk about the, the boyfriend's fashion sense. Well, yeah, we should also mention that I think he's supposed to be like a like a young 20-something in his early 20s, and he has the, the under-eye bags of like a 40-year-old man. And, and we have to... <laughs> he's wearing a cut-off shirt that says, pull my finger. This was 2005. <laughs> I'll let, I'll let that one pass. I'll let that one slide. For he's also he's also wearing enormous <laughs> jean shorts that go down to his mid shin, um, with a wallet chain. Again, again, this is two thousand and five. Uh, he has an he has an eyebrow piercing. Yeah, very two thousand five. Two thousand and five. Uh, I'll reiterate. An anti eyebrow. Yeah. In a couple of scenes, his nails are painted black, and then in other scenes, they're not. Oh, my favorite thing about his physical appearance is that it is the thing that isn't about his physical appearance, and that is that the, the the Charlie Day Texas Baron character <laughs> says like, "Oh, my daughter's gone off with her again, or that with that with that darn tattooed boy again." That ta- he calls him that tattooed punk. Punk, yeah. <laughs> Messing around with that tattooed punk cuts back to tattooed punk. Guy has no tattoos. No None. Tattoos. Zero. <laughs> Which means that they just wrote it in the script, but they couldn't even. Yeah, when they cast him, they, they forgot couldn't... to write it out. I... Oh my god! You know what would have been fucking hilarious? Do you guys remember those uh, pull-on tattoo sleeve, fake tattoo sleeves that you could buy at like hot? Yeah. Time? At least they would have had continuity. That, I mean, that's what I wish they had done. That. <laughs> it was. It was like peak era for that too oh, which yeah. is great S- saying this movie has a continuity problem is well the the oh, really boy. the really confusing thing is that our main character like immediately falls in love with this with this guy um who is like your your generic like horror movie t- tough guy bad boyfriend tough guy doofus they he, bond with the story about how she punched him in the so nose he, when, he, like, when they were kid. six. Yeah. yeah, and they're like playing off like the same age, but that dude is like like ten good. ten years older than her at least. Yeah, like at at least it's just like the the turnaround where he goes from like like bad boy asshole to all of a sudden the the love interest is there's no transition whiplash it's, inducing. It, yeah, seriously, it, it's insane and the main character's all like oh i thought you were with verna or whatever her name is it's something bad like that uh and he's like nah not really i just keep her around for to to pay for the pizza and the beer (laughs) like (laughs) who is this character why why is is he sympathetic oh well you know what i guess the reason he's sympathetic is because i think he's the voice of the audience a lot because he is very ready to point out when things don't make any sense which is all the time constantly constantly uh i don't i'm not sure if that's self-awareness on the movie's part or it was just sort of like a like a freudian slip that got in there where the writer which I guess was Charles Band, subconsciously acknowledging that his movie didn't make any sense. I feel like it was a little bit of both. Yeah, probably. Like, this movie is punny enough to that it's it's self-aware for sure to an extent. At times. Oh, yeah. I mean, when your monster's like, when I'm like, ah, I can never get a little shit, you know? Like, and it's just right. like, yeah, well, same when, goofy shit when, like that. When you're making a, a non-Christmas movie where the the villain is a, is a Christmas cookie, um... <laughs> Yeah, mm. it's something special. Yeah, um, my favorite uh, non-horror scene is when the ginger dead man is talking shit to the rat. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, <laughs> come here, come here, little shit! I'm gonna kick your ass! I'm just like, I'm gonna fuck this, you up. This rat like cleaning its whiskers. Peter the rat. Yeah, Peter the rat. Excuse me, cleaning his whiskers. Uh, and just like I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick your ass, you little piece of shit rat. And just like cutting back and forth, and the rat having no reaction. Uh, I also really like when the uh, the drunk uh, mom uh, first sees the ginger dead man, and he's like standing on a table, and he's got his little knife behind his back and over the course of like a solid two or three minutes she's like slowly approaching him with her finger out to like 
boop his tummy like the Pillsbury Doughboy. And the whole time, it just keeps cutting back to him. And he's like... <laughs> wife's still moving forward. Old wife's still moving forward. She's got her finger out. She's going to poke him. Oh, boy, she's going to poke him. And then he finally cuts her finger off. Yep. It, it but takes that long. But that's all he does. He cuts her finger off and then runs off, and she tumbles over backwards into a laundry bin where the the sassy Hispanic counter girl finds her and just thinks she's drunk and doesn't notice that she's absolutely covered in blood. And she's like, like her fingers off there's blood everywhere and she's like she's like knee cut off my finger and she's like she's like oh betty we got it. you i was afraid that you'd come back in and find your stash we got to get you home betty come on i'm going to take you home and there's just like blood spurting everywhere I'm like who bitch i mean in fairness the scene the last scene we'd seen the grandmother in was when she was shooting down the banner to the restaurant I'm next door with up, a ben. shotgun. I'm glad yep. you brought that up. Yeah, because across the street, like far, far across the street, this is a big like <laughs> Southern California strip, is the hotel building, diner, whatever the fuck it's supposed to be. And it's got the sign, the advertisement over the top of it. Yeah, and the wife comes out from all the way across the street, right out front of the bakery, with a twelve gauge shotgun and, and, perfectly... and like a and like a one seven five of Jack Daniels. Mm, oh yes, good point. And uh, and perfectly fires off both ends of the sign, which delicately falls down to the ground, but w- with a twelve gauge, like it was a rifle. <laughs> like like she she fired a birdshot twelve gauge at a, at a building from across the street, and no windows were blown out. No, right. it, no, like no, no screams from the hotel or anything. It just perfectly knocked off the nails on either side of the sign. Like what? Well, okay. And she was drunk doing it the whole time. Face. But okay, let's. Th- I think this is a good segue into uh, the setting of of this film. Um, so yeah, like it's the bakery or whatever. Um, but it's established that the bakery is just like on a street. You know, like it's not isolated. There's other buildings and businesses around. There's nothing that's keeping these people here. There's nothing that's keeping them from, like, going across the street or next door and using somebody else's phone to call for help. There's there's literally no sense of them being trapped, which is important for a horror movie where you're being hunted by something. You have to have the isolation. You have to be far away from getting help from anybody, you know? You have to be vulnerable, but there is none of that. Well, the only thing that keeps these people at this location is the fact that they keep forgetting about the ginger dead man. At a certain point, they do get fed up and try to leave. And uh, in response, the ginger dead man is set up maybe the world's worst booby <laughs> trap. No, I think it's the world's best. <laughs> okay, all right. A, a, a booby trap that can... That, well, here, explain explain the, the Rube Goldberg process of this shitty booby it's trap. It's barely Rube Goldberg. No, yeah, actually, that, um, that's too much credit. Uh, that implies there are more steps than there are. Okay, so more the... More like Boob Goldberg. Yes, this is a, a Boob Goldberg More trap. like Rube Bronzeberg, because it's bad. Mm, that was bad. It doesn't get first no. medal for traps. That was a reach. That was bad. You get a participation award for that one. Um, You don't even get the bronze for that one. Uh, maybe the bad puns are starting to rube off on me. God damn it. Uh, okay, I'm going to explain this, this booby <laughs> trap. The oil baron's daughter does decide to leave because she's been slashed in the face just a little bit though uh but she's worried about her looks so she decides to leave and she walks into a very conspicuous piece of rope uh stretched String. St- yeah no let's be real it was baking twine stretched across between something whatever uh held with, up by two people out of the shot held up by two people out of the shot um when she trips the the trip wire Something falls from the ceiling behind her, causing her to turn around. Then we get a reverse shot to Amos and the prote- face, and yeah. what's her face. And then it cuts back to the other girl, and she has a, a buoy knife 
embedded all the way to the hilt in yeah. her forehead. Right, deep. Like, and that's why I say it's the world's best booby trap. Because if shitty spring can set off some kind, or shitty twine can set off some kind of like chain reaction, like that has like a, a physical effect strong enough to embed a knife in someone's head. Like, <laughs> is it like fired out of a pneumatic cannon? Like, how does how does it work? What well, did he do? What, what system where did he build? There's no reason a knife like that would have ever been in a bakery. There's just no use for it. <laughs> um, and second of all, where did it come from? Like I said, when she trips the, the trap, something falls behind her onto the ground. And then we cut away from her and cut back and the knife is just in her forehead. Like, I don't know where it came from, how the, the trap got it there, why it was even in the bakery in the first place, it's just baffling. It is baffling. But it was really funny. I think we should also talk about the scene before that where her her Texas oil baron dad dies <laughs> um, yes, when the should. ginger dead man steals his car and very slowly pins him to a wall with it. Yeah, you have, you have this, like, good four second maybe five second long shot of the oil baron like looking into the headlights of the car and like, like backing up against yeah. a wall yeah like just no don't don't run as, me over as the, oh, as no, the ginger please, dead man don't like run me over like as you inches, slowly run me over inches the car into him but his daughter comes outside later <laughs> sees him there pinned up against the wall runs up to him starts daddy and just starts slapping his corpse and it cuts to him and his like eyes are open and he's got like blood leaking out of his mouth he's very obviously dead and she's like no daddy don't leave me I love you so much dad and then she she takes his ring off of his finger, puts it in her pocket. Sorry, Daddy. And says, I'll miss you so much, Daddy. And then goes back inside. Yep. <laughs> and then acts like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> It's amazing, honestly. We should also talk about the, uh, the uh, Hispanic... A uh, girl that gets knocked out with the the frying pan. Oh yeah, and, and put in the freezer, and with like icing, like the the She's ginger. covered in icing and has a up to her neck, and he and puts cherries like, on her titties. Cherries on her on her titties, like yeah. where her nipples would be. Which, that was weird. Yeah, which never has any payoff. They find her in the freezer. They pull her outside. They cover her with a blanket, and then they forget about her for most of the movie. They don't clean any in, of the... Until she wakes up with almost all of the, the icing. Gone. Off gone. It, no, it's yeah. off of her. Yeah, no, it's... They, they don't Never wipe explained. it off. No, it has no payoff. There's no reason for it. it, it her, her character is entirely a second thought. Like, I mean, it's it's kind of unfortunate like all we have is the the hispanic girl but like well the thing her, is, is her like, role in the shop like none of it is really like you you figure she's there to be like an extra body to be killed you know so they can rack up their body count but she survives yeah they don't even do that oh, <laughs> they don't even do that she just gets knocked out and and covered in icing and then forgotten about for most of the movie and shows up at the end to say she does save the day yeah kind, kind of she oh does, she also is a a kind of a love interest character for a wrestler dude. Oh, for Brick, yeah. yeah. For Brick, how did um, I forget that? Well, I name? mean, she's not really. Uh, after he eats the ginger dead man and saves the day, she's kind of like, "Oh, sexy wrestling man," but it's never set up that he's a love interest before that. Yeah, it felt like at the, at the beginning of the movie, you expect our protagonist to to get with brick like they have that kind of they relationship. share a moment they share they, yeah they share a moment but then she gets involved with the non, the non-tattooed tattooed punk and brick briefly becomes the love interest of the hispanic girl until he turns into the ginger dead man because that's what happens when you eat the ginger dead man you become him um, and then he monologues while backing or while conveniently moving in front of the door to the walk-in oven and they all just run at him and push him inside and lock the door. And then that, that's it. That's it. That, that's it. <laughs> He's that easily defeated. We should talk about maybe 
my favorite line delivery in any movie. <laughs> I was just going to say before, before, say before we finish. So when it's uh, just Tattoo Punk and the main character, they're uh, they're kind of freaking out, trying to stay away from the ginger dead man. And like the tattooed punk like shoots at him a bunch at nothing yeah just kind of shoots into the corner he has this like massive like 357 magnum revolver that has unlimited that has unlimited ammo like the ginger dead man shoots it probably 30 times in a row uh it's never ever out of bullets i don't know where he got it he just has it at one point but yeah so they're they they get backed over by the oven and they see the uh, the grandma's finger lying on the table with like her wedding ring on it, and. What is it? What is it? And that happens, <laughs> and it took us so by surprise. We had to run it back. We had honestly. to run. That we had to run it back and rewatch it. It broke me. It's maybe one of the funniest things I... that I've ever experienced in any movie ever. Hey! Where did you check my phone? Oh, oh, just... just absolute what? incoherent shrieking. <laughs> like, just becomes beaker. <laughs> and then she... She runs over to the oven and just starts screaming wordlessly and banging on <laughs> yeah. the door. It's oh, it, mm. one of a kind. Chef honestly. kiss. Mwah. And um, yeah, well, that's that's Ginger Dead Man. Yeah, the movie ends with this wonderful uh, ending track made by Charles Band. Oh yeah, this like really weird Charles Band Band. This really weird song that like at time sounded like he was trying to do like a chris cornell kind of thing um and it's over the credits it's it's like old 80s sitcom style credits where it shows uh shots of the actors like several shots of each actor back to back with their name over it every single actor in this movie i thought they were just gonna do it for like the the important characters quote unquote important characters but it, they did it for every single person no, who appeared between, in the movie. Between this sequence, the very long opening credit sequence of the the ginger, like just the the baking stu- goods that was boring as fuck. The right. overlong sequence, and then the very long crawl credit credit crawl. sequence at the end of it. Like with about the, a with sixth the, of this movie, it's probably like ten minutes of credits in this movie. It's being probably generous, a solid more. forty to forty five minutes of actual movie in yeah. this movie. Like they. Oh, I think that's generous. Like, like you could, you could cut. I mean, you could trim this movie down with all like the slow shuffling. Like, right, if well, you get the slow shuffling out of this movie, like it's this film is credits, slow shuffling, and very bad acting once or twice, and a shitload of Dutch angles. Mm-hmm. Like this is this movie is like a cl- a classic example of a concept that would have made a really fun clever like five minute short film Mm -hmm. but for some reason they wanted it to be a feature and even so they could only get it up to 70 minutes with a good 15 minutes of that being credits like you, you you have less than an hour of actual movie it's it's awesome i loved it uh it was so bad and um it yeah it was not not Christmas even tangential. Um, so Merry Christmas to everybody from us here at Pod People. The Ginger Dead Man was not even a little bit Christmas related, um, but made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. it's all the, the, the festive holiday cheer I need, oh, honestly. Yeah. I mean, belly laughs do like, y'all, at times. Do y'all want to rate it? Sure. Um, I'll start, I guess. Uh, this is one of those movies where it's absolutely so bad it's good. You know, I forgive a lot of its shortcomings just because it's so damn entertaining to watch and it brought a bunch of belly laughs to all of us and we genuinely had a great time watching it. Yeah. It is very bloated for a 70 minute movie. <laughs> <laughs> um but Gary Busey is fun. 
Um, the puppetry, while it's very low budget, is kind of fun. And the acting is so bad that it's hilarious. I'm going to give it... You know, especially... We'll talk about this in a minute. Mm-hmm. But especially in the context of the second one, I'll give this one a three and a half. All right. Um, yeah, this this movie gave me, the in a lot of ways, the same vibes that Thanks Killing did. I don't think it's executed quite as masterfully as as thanks killing uh was but it 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 hit a lot of the same notes for me uh in terms of so bad it's good i have to go with an ironic rating on this one because if i was being honest from like a filmmaking standpoint like this is a fucking terrible movie it's dog shit but for the amount of enjoyment that i got out of it i'm gonna give it uh, a strong four out of five pods (laughs) yeah um uh this this movie was really fun to make fun of like this this movie was really fun to laugh at i'm gonna go with uh, i mean it's tricky for me i think a lot of the things that i was i was laughing at um i mean of course the that horrible line is easily like just just got a beautiful reaction out of me and that that singular moment was worth watching the movie for and here it is um, again Right? I mean, it's so. It's just wow. It's ah, uh, it's gorgeous. What a perfect ah, uh, what a perfect read. The the emotions. <laughs> that, those emotions had so many polygons in them. David Cage would be proud. Like they're gorgeous. I uh, that that moment alone was just such a delightful gem. But. Uh, so many other moments in that film uh, that got laughs out of me were were more out of joke material. I think it was me giggling over. Oh, it's like you know Carl had to get back to pick his kids up from school, right. you know, so he couldn't run the camera anymore. So they had to you know end the scene. There's a lot of that like just sloppy, lazy sort of stuff. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm gonna say three point five. Like it because the, the laughs were very good. Like I had a great time watching this movie. Uh, I, I I feel good about that. Like it's it's a it's a generous three point five. Uh, you guys want to hear something funny? Yes. I saw on IMDb that apparently this movie was originally supposed to come out in two thousand one. They had slated it to come out in like May two thousand one. They even had a trailer early on, but they didn't complete it until two thousand five. It got stuck in development hell for five years. (laughs) The ginger dead man. What? (laughs) You could have shot this movie in a weekend. That's awesome. Isn't that incredible? I shot it. The original Little Shop of Horrors was shot in like 12 hours or something ridiculous, right? Like 24 hours? I think it was shot in a day? What? 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 That's amazing. Four I lo- years? I love the thought for of people. This? I love the thought of people slaving away over the ginger <laughs> dead man for almost five years. Because if it was supposed to be released in May of two thousand and one, <gasps> that means that they started pre production in two thousand. I'm just imagining Charles Band writing like eight hundred drafts of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that tattooed punk. Yeah, that's good. <sighs> As he, as, he snor- as he snorts a massive line of oh, coke let's, off, of a, off of a gingerbread man. Like, this is a theory, but just about every actor, like, looked coked up to me. Yeah. Especially well, the tattooed punk. Up. Everybody, yeah, dude, every- he had very wide eyes. For no reason. It wasn't a character thing well, he, either. He, like, looked, he looked like he was going through, like, heroin withdrawals a little bit. Like, he looked kind of haggard to me. Mm-hmm. Um... That also could have just been age, because uh, he definitely wasn't twenty two. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that that's a that's a really good point. I think everybody was pretty coked out, uh, and everybody was doing those really f- corny, over the top Southern accents. Like they were trying to really make us believe that this was in Texas, but this was like a, a Southern Californians approximation of what they think Texas might be like back in like the 1960s. Well, I don't know, Tease. We're from <laughs> Alabama. You don't think they did a good job? Shook them up. I sure think they could have done a lot better. Ooh, well, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I've been to enough uh, 
uh, enough uh, roll tide football games to think that they just they really got the southern spirit. You guys want to know something bad? What's that bad? As you, someone who you, you grew Yankee up, fuck. as what someone who grew up in the Midwest, there's a lot of people who unironically believe you guys are like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm oh yeah i'm under i'm under no illusions <laughs> at all um but that will give the ginger dead man an average rating of 3.7 out of five pods and before we move along to the astounding sequel now here's a word from our sponsors oh man you just you just threw that one at me oh i got i mean i mean <clears throat> yes yes our, our our sponsors um uh this is brought to you by um, Chef Snarblewitz's gingerbread seasoning. <laughs> Chef Jarble's gingerbread seasoning. It's more than ginger. It's love. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Chef Snarblewitz. Jarble. Viewers be advised, ginger is the only thing in uh, Chef Snarble's gingerbread mix. Not FDA approved. Mmm, I sure do love these gingerbread cookies. Where'd you get them? Side effects may include the following. Kind of spicy, because ginger. Ah! These Ask cookies are spicy! Ask your doctor about Chef Crumpley's gingerbread seasoning. My favorite kind of seasoning for gingerbread. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, so, yeah, we also watched uh, Ginger Dead Man 2, uh, The Passion of the Crust, and or Bakery of Blood. Yep. Yep. Um, which, in, in the opening credits, it's <laughs> Bakery of Blood, but in the closing credits and on the poster and in the ad and in the, in the trailer movie. at the end of Ginger Dead Man 1 it's Passion of the Crust so uh, uh, my guess is it got too much controversy and they got scared and changed it last minute after they'd already done all the yeah. other, like promo but they, stuff. But they yeah. still, but they still left Passion of the Crust on the they on forgot the, on the poster and at the end <laughs> they forgot at the that end. That wouldn't surprise yeah. me. Um, I what you think Charles Band watches the movies he produces? <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, yeah, this one was not written and directed by uh, Charles Band. It was directed by uh, Sylvia Saint. Saint Croix or Saint or, or or, or San Croix for all my Midwestern La Croix drinkers out there and Sylvia Saint Crocs for yep. I guess Morty's out there I don't know where the fuck I was going with that just cut that. <laughs> um the mm, I I don't have a ton to say Me about either. this movie to full be disclosure honest. full disclosure I, I have time. seen this one before but I hadn't seen the first one. I, I saw this this one in high school, and it was completely out of context, and we had no idea what to expect, and we hadn't seen the original, so we didn't know Gary Busey was the guy at all. And He's not in this one. I remembered liking it a lot more in high school, mostly because I think out of context is funnier. To go back to the, the thanks killing analogy, I had a lot of the same problems with this movie that I did with Thanks Killing 3. Oh, 100%. In the fact that it obviously had a much higher budget and it was way too self-aware. Too much budget for its own good, too honestly. Much, too much budget for its own good. It was still mostly practicals and puppetry and shit, but it's it's too it's too self-aware. It's too meta. Um, it's about the making of, uh, another, like, Roger Corman, or I guess, uh, Charles Band style, like, B-movie, and then the set gets invaded by the ginger dead man, but for no reason. The, the movie they're making doesn't have anything to do with the ginger dead man. No, it's about, like, killer puppets. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a puppet master 
like knock tiny off. tears i think it was called yeah something like that and that's that's something that i was thinking through this whole movie is that not only is it once again not christmas themed at all but also there's no reason for the ginger dead man to be the villain the fact that he is the ginger dead man is completely irrelevant to the actual film the role could have been filled by any f- sort of killer yeah, it's it's a real fish out of water movie you know <laughs> it's a movie about making a movie it's you know it's really gonna be something yeah it reminded me in a lot of ways of uh terror firmer which we watched yeah, uh, a couple months thing, ago but worse yeah well it's funny because terror For- firmer is like two and a half hours long almost like, that movie is ridiculously long, where this movie is about 70 minutes, but it almost feels longer than Terra Firmer. Well, yeah, because um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get as balls to the wall as Terra Firmer. And I think that's its biggest problem, honestly. Yeah. I think it doesn't go far enough. I agree. Because when it does go over the top, it is kind of funny yeah, it, yeah like, well, like like from a movie making perspective yeah it definitely it, it's definitely like very safe for its budget and and also like the writing is just very try hard well and oh, when, that's, when, the thing, hard. Yeah. when yeah, that's what killed when me. they start with the the movie within the movie i my hopes were up because Same. it is very ridiculous you have like these tiny terrors where like one of them is a the the percolator um and uh, another uh, yeah. is uh yeah it's just a coffee great. pot with machine guns yeah. yeah we started with really high hopes and like uh, all of us, yeah. dildo with eyeballs and groucho Marx eyebrows, eyebrows in like a suit <laughs> i i will say that i i was enjoying like probably the first like 20 minutes of this movie we've been invaded um yeah i i I was enjoying this movie for a little while, and the self-awareness wasn't bothering me too much, because it reminded me of Terror Firmer, and it's like, oh, you know, it's jokey about, like, the making of these terrible B-movies, but then, weirdly enough, it gets really up its own ass with that, like, halfway through, and carries it on towards the end. Well, yeah, because one of the main characters, like, this hotshot producer suit guy... He's constantly talking about how he wants to make his family a movie right, studio. He's, yeah, he's taken over the the studio after his father. You know. Yeah. Died. He's like stepping. He into wants his to dad make shoes. his dad proud by keeping the studio afloat and continuing to make thousands of do you, Z grade movies. Do you think? And I know, I know, uh, Charles Band didn't write this movie, but I know he produced it, so he was probably involved in the writing process to some extent. Do you think that that's how Charles Band sees himself to Roger Corman? That like Roger Corman was like the father. Oh, a hundred percent. Making all of these movies, and now he's the and Charles Band is the son 100%. stepping into his shoes. And on top of that, all of the the commentary about uh, the the critics. Oh um, yeah. I I felt like they were pulling angry IMDb comments straight off of their own movies and just reading them at points in the movie. It did get weirdly self righteous about that, and that's what bothered yeah. me. Oh, it was just like it was just the heavy handed meta. Like, yeah, I, I, I love will a say good meta like goof. But yeah, it, same. It, it was not good. Meta. I will say like, at the same time that is one of my favorite subplots having the uh, the Make a Wish kid who's like a twenty seven year old who acts like a ten year old, and they treat him like a ten year old. Well, see, that's I will say I will say the commitment to that bit is very funny. <laughs> Because, like, he shows up in the wheelchair, and he's, like, not even bald. Like, he has, like, a buzz cut, and it's obviously, like, a 30-year-old dude, but he talks like this, and, oh, man, oh, gee, sir, I sure do love your studio's movies. They've changed my life, or what's left of my life. I've seen every every movie your father's ever made. Like, he talks like a child, and for the whole movie, we were just making fun of that, like, how it's, like, a 30-year-old dude in a wheelchair behaving like a child and then it turns out that he's like a, an online like horror movie blogger he's read all of the screenwriting books and, and he's <laughs> he's angry about the creation of this of this 
newest Tiny Terrors movie because he thinks it's it's an affront to the studio's legacy or something. So this is pretending to be a Make a Wish kid is his overly <laughs> convoluted plan to get onto the set and sabotage it, which I think as as a bit is pretty clever. It's pretty funny. And on top of that, even funnier is his handler, this, uh, this woman that's been pushing him around for, we could only assume for weeks at this point yeah because right. she implies like they it's went just, to like a state they, fair that, and other stuff yeah like, they went to like an amusement park that he's just been playing this, yeah. this bit <laughs> he's been playing the long game <laughs> the long yeah. God. Yeah. i i did think that was pretty funny but where it started to get a little too like ham-fisted too. was when uh he's like waving the gun around he's like strapped a bomb to himself and the the producer pretty boy character is like you know what you're right you've shown me that i do need somebody like you on my team i'm gonna give you a deal for uh i'm gonna give you a three film deal to let you write and my company's gonna produce them and the guy's like oh wow i guess it really can happen you know i live in my mom's basement right and i'm and i'm not self-sufficient and he's like no i didn't know that grimaces and it's it's like oh yeah movie reviewers all live live in their parents basements i'm and i'm not trying to be like like getting defensive because we're film critics and we're critiquing this movie like oh he hurt my feelings he's making fun of film critics it it just wasn't it just wasn't subtle at all it was like and then and then when the the ginger dead man kills the the critic guy because he he needs a a virgin to complete his ritual or something he's like oh, i got myself an unsuspecting virgin ha, ha 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 i got a virgin you get it he's the virgin like he even says that he's a virgin like three times like they're oh, yeah. really really trying to hammer it down your throat yeah and then at the end there there's like a uh, night before christmas style narration that bookends the film and at the end, it's even like, don't listen to critics. Those guys are assholes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like the, the writer who's just like jacking off the whole time he's writing this fucking yeah, script. Fuck, like this, this film was just critics. so much like it was just so fucking masturbatory at times. But you know, the whole time was like, oh, yeah, we got a really nice dig in on film critics. So now they can't they can't say anything about how shitty our movie is. Right. Otherwise, because, they'll just seem like self- they're personally offended. R- right. Exactly. Like, like, yeah, we really got those fuckers. Yeah. Roasted. Yeah. I'm so we're fucking gonna, smart. We're going to call them virgins who live in their mom's basement. Got them. <laughs> I will say that there were a couple moments in this movie that I thought were genuinely funny. Oh, yeah. And I, I want to talk about I a agree. couple of chuckles. those. There were some um, chuckles. By all means. One of my favorite is one of the uh, other studio lots is filming Star Spankers. Oh, uh, yeah. That was pretty 2015, good. 2015, I think it was called. And they were just spanking this girl with like paddles to try to get the. Uh, the the alien out from inside of her I and did, i did think that was pretty funny and on top of that uh the the director uh when asked how the performance was he's like you well, got it all on film right well no he he has a newspaper in front of his face and one of the actors is like oh how did you how do you think i did do you think i did good like did you like what i was doing and like puts the paper down he like leans over to the camera operator he's like He's like, did you get it on, or was it in focus? The guy's like, yeah, as far as I could tell. He's like, yeah, I thought you did a great job, and just puts his yeah, newspaper it, back up. Awesome. Which is most definitely like a comment on the previous Gingerbread Man movie. <laughs> right. we, we were saying that while we were watching. And, well, right, with those with those lines like, oh, you can take take off early for the night. Mm. It's like, was that good? Uh, was it in focus? Uh. You sure? Mm-hmm. All right, moving on. <laughs> you know? You're really going places, kid. All right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, this movie had some really dated humor, but I still thought the when the next time we see the director, the uh, the kid in the wheelchair is like, oh, this director, he's an auteur known for his gothic styling and uh, latent homoerotica. <laughs> and then there's this just really jack guy in an angel suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like flexing. <laughs> No, I did think that was pretty funny. I mean, it it does have it does have a couple of its of its uh, 
moments of like poking yeah. fun at itself and but it's 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 also, just what was up with the random actor um who looked nothing like sir ian mckellen who they kept referring to as sir to, ian uh, sir ian kavanaugh uh yeah i don't know who ends up saving the day at the end and coming in with a what they make sure to mention earlier in the movie is an actual real loaded AK forty seven with to live blast, bullets, yeah, yeah, to to blast the puppets and the whole movie they're trying to get him out of his trailer because he's acting like a prima donna and then when they're captured by the the film critic and the evil puppets that come to life at the end through actual magic somehow then sir, sir yeah, yeah virgin so, yeah. sacrifice uh sir ian shows up and blasts them all and is like that looked pretty cool didn't it please tell me you got that on camera there's where's the whole crew ha 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 uh yeah that was that was weird that was weird. It didn't bother me too it, much. It wasn't. It wasn't. Terrible. It was one of the no, less it was offensively it was annoying hokey. things. No. I, well, here, what, what, really, just I thought was was obnoxious was like the, like the that's the way the cookie crumbles. Ha ha. Yeah. And you know, I will, I will Line. say that like I wasn't looking for like super creativity with the kills in this movie, mm. but most of them were were pretty lame. A couple downright almost offensive uh um yeah like the, 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 the gay character work were straight up like yeah offensive. that that's the one that i'm thinking of in particular like the makeup artist is just like this overly flamboyantly gay dude that in something like terror firmer and like a, a sleazier like trauma production would not feel offensive <laughs> Because, as we talked about when we talked about Terra Firmer, is that, like, trauma is very much being, like, we're freaks making movies about freaks for freaks. Um, so you get a lot of those, like, really over-the-top style characters. But in this, it just felt weird. And it's like, they went stereotypical to the point where like he leaves a room going i love a parade <laughs> and it's like what the what and then they kill him by the, yeah, the, ginger the, dead g man. the ginger dead man fucks him in the ass with a with a curling iron yeah and he's like he enjoys and it, he's like and enjoying like, it he's like yeah. coming no but, but like the whole time too like like leading up to it the gingerbread man's like i'm gonna get you you little fucking queer and he's like it's time time for a slice of fruit cake yeah um like like they got in every like just yeah. like yeah basic fucking like lowest lowest hanging fruit like, i mean gay rig riff they could get in there the one thing i will say about it is it was 2008 and that was like the peak of humor at that point that's true that's and true and it has not aged well no no and absolutely. it does not give it a pass but well, it does explain a little bit it's, of just, it. it's, it's like oh look at us we're edgy you know and and then there's also uh, the the scene where uh the like 80s actress with like the lopsided boob job like legitimately harvey weinstein <laughs> was like one of the extras into banging her like he's she well first of all she approaches him in the bathroom um and then just doesn't like, take no and then for an doesn't answer. take no for an answer blocks the door keeps grabbing him and can trying to talk him into banging while he's her trying to get out while he's tr room. while he's trying to flee and then she says i'll introduce you to every casting agent i know and they just immediately start fucking yeah. which is like if this was if if the position was reversed if it was a man doing this to a woman in in a film it well, would, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily relevant, but like, I, I mean, mean, it's no, it's not, but because I don't, I don't think that comparison even needs to be made. Like, it's all it's, I'm, it's all fucked I'm up saying, on its own, right? But, it's it, well, that's what I'm saying is like, but they they get away with it as as a joke, you know? Like, it's it's fucked up. It's not it's not like funny from any perspective regardless of of who it is yeah. but because it's it's like oh that a woman doing that to a man ha 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 that's so funny 
you know, it's that that's their logic with yeah. like trying yeah, to okay, get yeah. away with it. That's, yeah, because that's because it's yeah. understood that it happens so often the opposite yeah. way around. Right, the, right, right, yeah, right, right, right. The the shitty the, you're saying yeah, the the film was making that shitty point, and I do and I do agree that that's fucking dumb. As right, hell. right, right, like, right, right. Yeah, and yeah, and then that's the film's perspective on the yeah. Like if I was a man, you know, it would be different. And the worst part about it too is that they show like a they they show like to a soft core porn degree that that scene well yeah because the we have to sh- show the ginger dead man sneaking up behind them with a knife and the just they just keep cutting back to the sex and it stops being fun well, it, it, it was you, never really funny but it it just gets uncomfortable yeah. it gets really not funny after it gets really yeah. not funny and then the ginger dead man stabs through the woman's back. Well, first off, he like he like jacks off watching. Oh them yeah, and, like, that's has a right. Cigarette. Yeah, I had I had already yeah. blocked that out. Yeah, yeah, he it's horrible. He jacks off what his retractable gingerbread peen. I don't know. And yeah, and then they they do the gag where he's smoking a cigarette afterwards. It's, I mean, I thought that was yeah. kind of funny. Well, no, the cigarette, was the, the cigarette bit was the funny, but it was just like one of the many cuts where it kept cutting back and forth between the, the ginger dead man and this, these people fucking. And it's just like, right. just like for, for minutes, you know, like, like that scene was just yeah. went on yeah, and it's, oh, it, not yeah, something it, I wanted it, to see. It's, it's too much. And it's. It's not it's not even the kind of thing where like it starts being funny and then it stops being funny and then it starts being funny again for how long it goes on. It's not over the top enough. It's it just is not funny to begin with and it just gets less funny the yeah. longer it it's, goes. It's and yeah, and the whole thing is just again so self-aware to yeah. to an unhealthy degree. Like it's not it's not a, it's it's like, "Oh, look, we're being self-aware. We're being meta." Haha. It's like, right. Oh. It's sad when Charles bands pull my finger sense of humor is funnier than a lot of the humor in this movie yeah no i think that's i think that's absolutely true Mm -hmm. and then we even get that scene almost immediately after where like the the puppet designer guy is like doing something with one of the the evil puppets and the ginger dead man he's like fixing it like fixing it from under the table and the ginger dead man thinks that it's like the love of his life. The love of he, his life. He fucks the puppet while it's in the dude's hand, and then and well, he even keeps saying like, "You've got a face only a mother could love." And then after saying some really bad, not funny bread-related sex jokes, like "You're making my loaf rise," then he's like, "Well, if you're not gonna put out, then I'm just gonna have to put you out or something," and like was, yeah. cuts. The, the puppet in half and it cuts the guy's hand off just like what the what the fuck like have better kills than these guys like yeah. come on try harder yeah you put all of your budget into like i don't care if you're trying to make like a silly dumb self-aware bad movie at least have like some have some creativity in like your in your schlock and your gore that's the place for your creativity to shine in a movie like this and that's honestly probably the weakest part of the movie in a lot of ways. Y'all want to rate this? Do y'all yeah, else yeah. Let's let's, let's go for yeah, it. Let's not bore anything. Um, anymore. do you want to start, Cleve? Uh, yeah. This movie, like the puppet gags, were great. Like the at, at the beginning. Fuck. What what was it? What was the the, the per kill later? The per kill later was great. Like you know, cause it, it's it's practically just a Dalek, and I, I thought that was great. Um, that also, that one that one got the, an actual laugh out yeah. of me. Yeah, yeah, same. And then like the the mech puppet like when he turns like the robot puppet into the gingerbread man turns it like an evangelion mech like that was pretty fucking funny um a couple of 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 beats did land but for the most part like even like like tension moments like leading up to kill scenes and stuff i was just like get on with it right like i had a lot of i had a lot of those yeah like i'm i'm giving it progress please i'm i'm giving it a generous two yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot more on top of that. It's it's a it's a seventy minute movie that somehow manages to feel longer than Terror Firmer, which was two and a half hours. Yeah, like it 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 had me laughing for maybe like the first twenty minutes or so, but it quickly got old in its shtick, and uh, it it got weirdly self righteous in ways that it 
shouldn't have, I don't think. Um, I, I think I'm going to give it a two as well. Like, it had some fun gags. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but, like, man, it, it definitely helped qualify what I thought was so funny about the first one. Mm-hmm. Ginger Dead Man 2 really taught me that Full Moon does much better unintentional comedy than it does intentional comedy. Um, This movie felt way too long. Even though it was only 70 minutes, it felt way longer, like you were saying. There were a couple of really funny bits in it, but they didn't outweigh all of the, uh, the really unfunny bits. And it almost felt like it had too much budget for its own good. They go a little too meta and self-aware, and it kind of is its own shortcoming. Um, It's not the worst movie I've ever seen, and it's not even the most boring movie we've talked about on the podcast by any means. Definitely not. But it's a disappointment, especially compared to the first one. Yeah. I'm going to give it a two out of five as well. All right, well, that's a unanimous two out of five pods for Ginger Dead Man 2, The Passion of the Crust slash Bakery of Blood. Passion of the Crust is actually a better subtitle because this movie had nothing to do with a bakery. But he does get crucified. He does. Oh, yeah, we didn't even talk about that. He does in the I mean... movie by the other puppets crucify him uh, in a very long, drawn-out scene where uh, as they're nailing his little gingerbread hands to the cross he keeps saying oh it hurts a lot um that was weird but yeah two two out of five from all of us see it or don't whatever i I would yeah i would recommend i I just watch the first one it's way more fun and then go watch thanks killing if you're looking for the same kind of fun um well i'm gonna do something i don't normally do and i'm gonna lay out our schedule of episodes for the next few weeks Uh, Because with the holiday times coming up, we're going to be all doing some traveling and stuff. So we're we're putting a lot of that shit together for you right now. Uh, Next week, we will be doing a uh, retrospective of Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 and 2, keeping up with the the, uh, Yuletide fear spirit of things while we still can. Um, So look forward to that. Uh, the week after, which is uh, a couple days after Christmas, I believe. Yep, the final episode of 2018. The final episode of 2018. Uh, we will be doing a episode on Mandy that the three of us recorded several weeks ago. I cannot recommend that enough. Uh, yeah, Ooh. check check out that episode. Man, yeah, um, that was a great movie. Yeah, we've been holding on to that. Uh, it's a good episode. Oh, yeah. Waiting, waiting to drop it for you. Yeah, when did we record that one now? Like Ooh, a month ago? Yeah, Roughly? probably. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've, been, we've been sitting on it for a while, so that'll be coming Wait, uh, the, week, the week of Christmas. And then uh, the first week of 2019, we'll be doing part one of our 2018 wrap-up. Uh, we'll be talking about the hits and the shits and uh all the bits and all the bits in between and uh setting up our expectations for 2019 and wrapping up our 2018 predictions yes 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 indeed um so yeah you can look forward to that uh on january the third i believe right the beginning of the new year so that's what we have in store over the coming weeks we hope you're looking forward to it as much as we are getting into that uh that spirit of the season. Um, it, we're getting into the... Gingerbread season. Gingerbread season. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> getting, into, getting into fuck you 2018 territory. So, uh, yeah, look for that. If you like the show, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And how could you not? And how could you not? It's such <laughs> a good show. Here we are every week coming to you with our thoughts and... Uh, and uh, not funny comedy bits. Yeah, we, we cook up with the best stuff for you, just like my grandma's cannoli. <laughs> um, so yeah, go on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating and review. Help us work our way up in the numbers. Uh, follow us on social media or on Twitter specifically at PodPeoplePod. Pod. Um, follow us on Letterboxd, uh, letterboxd.com slash PodPeoplePod for lists of all the films we've talked about on the show. Uh, our average ratings and links to those episodes. 
Uh, we're going to be utilizing Letterboxd a lot in our year-end retrospective. Um, so get on get on board. Download Letterboxd, get an account, whatever. It's free. They're not sponsoring us, but I can't recommend that site enough. You can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Van Awesome. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. And I'm sometimes on Twitter tweeting for Light Arc Studios. Uh when we have things to tweet about, which soon we should be. Well, I'm going to be very, hopping back on that Twitter account pretty soon. Now, we are we are coming up on uh, uh, completing the, the demo for our game, It Stares Back, and oh boy, is it going to be good. Woo. So if Man. you like thrills and chills and strategy games, uh, follow our Light Arc Twitter page for some very exciting news coming very soon. Oh, yeah, we're about to bring some good art to you people. Oh, man, we excited about it. Hell, yeah. Um, and, you know, thank you for listening to us and being with us in this time of year when it gets chilly and we can all snuggle down by the fire and just talk about those movies that give us the Hebrew jeebles. We're the pod people, and I'm gonna let the credit song of Ginger Dead Man 1 carry us on out. See you next time. Salute. Bye.